<laughs> we're back. We're back. And we're live again. It's so exciting to be back. Uh, welcome to End Time Talks. This is the podcast that is the official podcast for the Return Conference. And we are so excited to be back. Gary. It's, it's been a while. It's been a while. That's right. It's uh, been a while since three months? Since August. Yeah. yeah. We haven't been live since August. Yeah. Uh, we, we ended off the summer months teaching the End Time Timeline, which, by the way, was amazing. Yeah, it was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, Under the tent, so much, whiteboard. We just kind of did it. I'm going to miss the shorts and the nice hot cocoa. Yeah, all right. I mean, uh, refreshing drink. <laughs> but nevertheless, that was phenomenal and exciting. And, and now we're gearing up for the return conference at the Amazing. end of the year. Yeah. Now, I'm sure everyone who's watching right now is watching and asking, who is this other person at the table? Okay. But we're going to introduce him in a second. Why don't we'll we hold off on that? <laughs> He's our mystery guest. But first, we want to say to you, thank you for joining us. Uh, as you know, we are now back again, and we're going to be here every week leading up to the return conference. So if you haven't done so already, hit the share button and let everyone know that we are now on live. And click the like button as well. It helps the algorithm push out this, this program a little bit further. But make sure you uh, just let your calendar know that you're going to be watching this, sitting down with us every week. You have a seat at the table to join us for End Time Talks every week at this same time, and we're so excited to be back now, and to, now Bernie, to, to the, uh, talk about our new topics. This whole show was built around the uh, return conference at the end of the year. That's right. Now, a lot of people may not know what that is, so let's catch everyone up. Sure. This is our... Fourth? fourth annual fourth conference. Year. Yeah, fourth year. And what is it? What, what do we do? Yeah, so the Return Conference is a four-day uh, intensive conference where every day we are engaging a different topic in the end times, and it's being hosted, or if you will, it's being brought to us by a different speaker um, who is probably, I would say, like an expert on the different topics yeah. they're addressing. And we have had phenomenal speakers in the past, Michael Brown, yeah. uh, Mike Bickle, uh, Joel Richardson, who's back this year. Andrew and we, Brunson. Andrew we Brunson. Had him that live, was amazing. Last that was yeah. an extraordinary opportunity to yeah. uh, to talk to him about his perspective. But again, you know, we address different topics of the end times uh, brought to us by different speakers, and it's kind of a two prong thing each day. Um, each day, we get the opportunity to interview the speaker, have a one on one casual conversation in front of a live studio audience, right. and that's always a lot of fun. And then in the evening, we come back and uh, we're in the prayer room and we worship together, and then we sit and receive a teaching that has been prepared for us by each of these speakers right. um, for that. That moment for this conference specifically, right. and it's and now we do it at time. a specific time of That's the right. year. That's right. And what what time is that? Yeah, right. it, so. it, it's the it's that last four days leading to the new year. Yeah. So it's it's this year. It's the twenty seventh through the thirty first, um, starting that Tuesday all the way up to that Saturday. I believe it is Friday yeah. or Saturday. It's Saturday. Uh, Saturday. We're gonna be just kind of every day just getting teaching deep in the Word, deep in worship, and this is gonna be an amazing conference this right. year. And we're so excited. So it's excited before about it. between Christmas and New Year's. That's right. Is that week that everyone's just trying to figure out what their life is going to be in 24. <laughs> so we get to help you with that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so we want you to make your plans just to, to be with us during that, that week. Absolutely. And you, know, you, you will be able to catch it on uh, virtually, whether it's on our app or right. on our social media platforms. But I got to tell you, there's nothing like being in the room. Right. Nothing being like able it. to be in the room and engaging in the conversation, engaging in the worship and listening to everything that's going forth. I mean, in context of being with everyone else is always an amazing and, experience. And then we end New Year's Eve. And then we ended it with a bang. Literally. With worship. <laughs> outside. It's worship. Then we go outside and we have It's always worked out with the weather. It's been an amazing night. Yeah. And then we actually have fireworks and we yeah. ring in the new year with great celebrations. Right. So make your plans time. now to be with us. So yeah, bring the family. The it's an amazing time. So you don't yeah. want to miss it. So mark your calendars December 27th through the 31st. And we'll bring you more details about the speakers later on. But right. just make sure you reserve those dates. Yeah, right we, now. we got great speakers. They're all lined up, all confirmed. That's it. And we'll leave that as a cliffhanger for <laughs> next time. Yeah, More to come. Because we want to get to our speaker. Absolutely. And you know, we're so excited to start off the new season of End Time Talks with a, a guest, a, a beloved brother, a esteemed minister of the Lord uh, from uh, IHOP Kansas City's prayer room. Brother, God bless you. This is Kirk Bennett, everyone. Yeah. Help me welcome him. Uh, yes. if, you're, if you're watching, clap with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad that he's here with us. He's been with us for a few days now. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about what you've been doing with us. I mean, you are here in part initially as an invitation that was extended to you from the Activate Internship, which is, if I can give a plug, sure. it's an important and very exciting uh, internship that we host here every year around this time of year, where for 12 weeks, we just go deep in the word of the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Just from creation to consummation. part-time internship. 
internship. And it's a, we have a part-time and so a full-time and version a full-time. of it as well. So right. you could also do some tracks. Um, but one of the classes that we introduced last year, and it was just a one-night thing, uh, we invited uh, our brother Kirk Bennett to come and teach us a little bit about the prophetic. And it was such an impactful night last year. Right? Mm-hmm. We did the prophetic, and it was like half the prophetic, and the other half was on biblical meditation. It was so impactful to everyone. It was the number one best night of the internship based on the surveys. Wow. People, everyone said that was the best night of the internship. Wow. So I said, okay, next year <laughs> he's coming that. back, but we're going <laughs> to, we're going to blow it up. Yeah. And instead of it being just one night, a couple of hours, we turned it into a week long thing. Yeah. And so he's been here with us since Tuesday night. He's going to be here, you know, tonight again for the Friday night encounter. Then yeah. he'll be back on Sunday at Maranatha church, but he's been teaching and unpacking for us all of these principles and truths of the, of, uh, you know, from the scriptures about the prophetic. And then, there's a component of the practical, which the Lord has given you such grace and wisdom to do, mm-hmm. that in the room, what you've just learned, you get to practice. Mm-hmm. Literally get to just let the Holy Spirit use you and lead you. And we've had so many amazing testimonies yeah. uh, come forth from that, brother. We're That's so great. grateful that you're here with us. Yes. Thank really last night was amazing as well. And, and you're here with us now here at End Time Talk. So this is a great way to start off this yep. new season of End Time Talk. So what are we going to talk about tonight, Gary? Okay, so we want to kick off... Uh, in the context of the return of Jesus. That's what Return Conference is all about, the return of Jesus. And the, the, uh, the glorious church functioning leading up to his return. Yeah. And uh, so one of the primary scriptures that uh, the church constantly consider, uh, because it was quoted and preached on at the birth of the church at Pentecost, is the Joel 3, Acts 2 scripture, which Joel 3, I have it here, I wanted to read it. It says, uh, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon handmaids. In those days I will pour out my spirit. I'll show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, pillage, and smoke. So, that Joel 3 was in the context of something that was taking place in Joel's day. And it's, it's just so interesting that Peter, after uh, during the day of Pentecost, the Spirit is poured out. Traditionally, we call that the birth of the church. Peter grabs on to Joel 3 and pulls it from the Old Testament into the New, but does more than just land on that day. He then catapults it forward by adding a phrase that Joel never mentions. Mm. Peter says, in the latter days, or in the last days, uh, as by the prophet Joel, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your uh, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall dream vi- visions, see visions. So Peter grabs from Joel, pulls, pulls it into the present, and then throws it into our day-to-day. Mm. So what I'd love to do is get Kirk's perspective. Yeah. Uh, being in the prophetic for prophetic ministry for 30 years? Yeah, 30, 40, 40 years. Uh, like like officially in leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have m- many, uh, the Lord called you when you first got saved and you had uh, prophetic experiences. Yeah. Uh, but in leadership for 30, 40 years... I would love to hear, Kirk, what what you think Peter, uh, Holy Spirit, Peter was thinking of that and how it actually um, manifests itself in the last days that we're in and are yet ahead of us. Because we know, as we've been talking on these talks and over the summer, uh, that the church is going to go through an unprecedented amount of trouble and tribulation yeah. in which we need endurance for. Uh but in that same trouble and tribulation and persecution, the Lord comes back for a glorious church. So the church will be operating at its highest function ever in history mm. at the same day that, at the same time in which persecution is coming upon her. Mm. Okay. Mm. And then Peter's going, and the Spirit's going to be poured out, and they're going to prophesy. How does that all work together, Kirk? Give us some perspective, and that'll open up a bunch of questions. You know, I think uh, one of the most commonly used terms in the Old Testament is a reference to the great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm. Uh, Isaiah talks about deep darkness covering the earth, but the glory of the Lord rising on the people of God. And, and so you have this great and terrible, dark and light, the, this, this 
juxtaposition of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Right. And the kingdom of light goes forward through prophecy, through a revelation of the testimony of Jesus, through the revelation of the glory of God, through the manifest presence of God. That's how the kingdom of light moves forward and the light overtakes the darkness. Mm. And that's what's going to happen. The deepest of darkness in history will be in that time, a deep darkness, it says, but the glory of the Lord will arise. Well, how does that arise? Just as, you know, some kind of sun that comes up that's brighter than normal? Mm -hmm. No, it arises through the people of God manifesting what, what John is told is the testimony of Jesus is that spirit of prophecy, mm. is that testimony of Jesus. So you see in the end time scenarios, you see you have two prophets, the two witnesses that come in the end time scenarios. You also have the seven thunders, which seems to be a movement in Revelation 10 between the sixth and seventh trumpet that, that, that evidently completes the mystery of God, so that at the blowing of the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is completed. So these seven thunders, so it's not just seals, trumpets, and bowls, it's, it's you know, seven seals, six trumpets, seven thunders, seventh trumpet, trumpet seven bowls. Yeah. And, and there, there's so many things that happen in between the lines that's going on because this is over a three and a half year period and of course a seven year period and, and, and all of that. And so that we're expecting it because it's been depicted in movies and that kind of stuff as this thing where everybody doesn't know what's going on. But the truth is, Daniel says the people of God, the people who know him, will be strong and do exploits in that hour. That exploits is through the manifestation of the power of God, mm. which we see in all the spiritual gifts, all manifest through speaking the word. Mm -hmm. And this is the difference. It's not by human effort and human strength that the word of the Lord goes forth in power. It's by the spoken word. Right. It's the word, the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. Yeah. And you know what? Let me interrupt yeah, you there for, to give wow. some clarity That's to good. everybody. So people think prophetic and they either skyrocket right. in a rocket ship out yeah. of control, sure. or they plummet to, yeah. let me run screaming out of the room. Sure. Okay, <laughs> and, and it's because, of course, uh, our human condition, we tend to abuse everything that sure. has any ounce of, of popularity, power, whatever. Yeah. Uh, prophecy. Uh, you know, we, we people go, well, is it Rama? Is it Logos? You touched on this this week. Yeah. Rama, Logos. And it's so interesting. I love that you said it. You said, yeah. if you look at the definition, <laughs> it means logos. of Logos, right? Because yeah. people go, Logos is written, Rhema is spoken. And I've been making this argument for years. <laughs> I love it. The definition is the same. Exactly. It, but they're both spoken. Yeah. They're Logo, both spoken. Logos is the voice of a person, is one it's of the, the of definitions person. in the list of definitions of the Logos. Right, right. It's the voice of a person. Yeah. yeah. And even like uh, when it mentions the, the different gifts and the uh, word of knowledge, the word for word, people, the Greek word, people would say, okay. well, that has to be rhema because knowledge, it's the right. rhema right. of God right. that release it. Yeah. It's logos. logos. I love it. <laughs> it's, so love it. that theology breaks apart yeah. just on that verse. Yeah, it so really does. So what, what are we talking about when we're talking about prophecy? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, key, of course, the Joel 2 prophecy, the Pentecost Acts 2, is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is what puts then, the instead of the Spirit with or upon, it's abiding in the believer. And so I have many people, you know, I want to know if I'm prophetic or not. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's really prophetic. Just get over it. You know? <laughs> and he's not mute. He talks. Jesus said he will guide you into all truth. He, right. he does teacher. that by video audio, you know, and th that's how he guides us into all truth. He's, he, he's a man dwelling on the inside. He's, he's the spirit of the Lord dwelling on the inside. That's what Joel is prophesying as the revelation that, that, of course, Ezekiel and Jeremiah talk about. This new covenant is the abiding of Christ on the mm. inside, the abiding of the Spirit of the Lord. And that Holy Spirit 
then abiding on the inside is gradually just cleaning out the closets of your life and overtaking till he takes up full residence inside of you. And, and when he begins to manifest outside of you, that's prophecy. Yeah. And, you know, at, at it's key, whether, whether you're walking it out or speaking it out or, you know, we, we uh, tend to use prophecy and its expressions mostly based on what I would call words of knowledge which is about the past. Typically, if someone has a word of knowledge and you go, wow, that's, that's the real word of the Lord, it's because they're giving you something that you know is true because it's happened in your past. Mm. That's a word of knowledge. There's also a word of wisdom, which is the now. And there's the word of prophecy, which is the forward. Okay, mm. And the Lord wants to manifest all, the, all of those. Now, what people have problems with is equivocating the, the, the prophetic word and the written word as needing to be the same thing. A prophetic word, a prophecy has to be, uh, you know, can't, it can, we can't have that because we have the written word and that's the final authority. Mm. But the written word is only predicted in gaps, and it's not predict predictive of every individual, but there are times when the written word manifests in your future, and, and, and that's okay. There are times when God tells somebody to speak that over you because it's going to manifest in your future. Mm. There are also times when the, the, the word of the Lord about your future, and a, a great example, I've just been going through this this week, of Samuel. When Saul meets Samuel, he gives him a list of events that are about to happen to him. They're not in the Bible. Mm. He's giving him a list of events, of prophecies. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to meet these people. You're going to meet these prophets. You're going to prophesy with them. You're going to find your, your, you know, your dad's donkeys and you know, the whole thing. He gives them, and it all happens exactly in order. Now, why is Samuel important? Because Peter brings up Samuel in the book of Acts. And he says, from the times of Samuel until now, the prophets have been prophesying this. It's talking about this new covenant. And what's unique about Samuel is none of his words fell to the ground void. Okay? Mm. Which, you know, we go, wow, that's amazing of Samuel. But that also means probably there were other prophets whose words did fall, fall wow. to the that ground was, yeah. void. Right. And so we say, oh, no, the prophet has to be right every time. If they're not, we stone them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the truth is the, the, that prophecy is brought through individual vessels, and there are parameters for the fulfillment of the prophecy. One of them is, is oftentimes the purity of the vessel and the cleanness of the vessel, the fruit in the vessel. But another parameter is the, the, the receiving and even the intercession around prophecy. All the prophecies that foretell in the future will come to pass, but the question is which generation? It's the generation who embraces praise that will see those things come to pass. Mm. And that kind of thing. So this idea, and I learned this as an evangelical, you know, well, if they're wrong, we just stone them. It's simple. Mm. But what do you do with Daniel? Because none of his words came to pass. They were all for the future. Do we stone him? Mm. Do we kill him? They tried, you know. Mm -hmm. What do you do with Jonah? Jonah's words were, were, were prophecy, but they were God is going to destroy this city. He never said, he never gave a condition of repentance and he wouldn't. He just said, God's going to destroy the city. God didn't destroy the city. Mm. So is Jonah a false prophet? No, of course not. So we have to understand that, that prophecy is not going by those parameters, and especially in the new covenant, because there's a new parameter that Holy Spirit lives inside of you, Holy Spirit lives inside of you, Holy Spirit lives inside of me. All God's people have the Spirit of the Lord to test prophecy inside of them. Okay, and, and, and so it's not a matter of are the words infallible, but will the word produce fruit? Mm. And the word can produce fruit unless the ground it lands on is 
is is hardened ground. You know, the whole parable of the sower is is a revelation of that. So the, there's an oversimplified version many times in 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 churches, and I you know I'm not trying to name names, but in churches that don't believe in prophecy, there's an oversimplified view. You also have in in Deuteronomy 13 where God says to Moses, Moses, a prophet or a dreamer comes into your midst. He gives you a dream, and the dream comes to pass. And he says, now let's go follow other gods. You're not to go with them. Because the Lord is testing you. The Lord allows a prophet to go. Now, the dream came to pass. That's accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. But the issue is not accuracy. The Lord is testing you to see if you love him. The issue is intimacy. Yeah. Right. At the end of the day. Right. And so all the word of the Lord, all the miraculous, all the spiritual, for, uh, first covenant, second covenant, all the prophets have one mandate. It's to turn people and move them closer to God. Amen. That's, That's right. it. Right. Old Testament, New Testament, it's the same thing. Move them closer to God. If you're inaccurate, but the people still move towards God... That's good. <laughs> you know, if you're accurate and the people move away from God, that's really the definition of a false prophet. Hmm. Someone, wow. not someone who's inaccurate, that's it's good. someone who's moving them away yeah. from God. Yeah. After, wow. you know, their ministry or after the gift and, and making the gift the God, yeah. you know, and, and this kind of thing. And today's, uh, unfortunately, today's judgment of somebody being a prophet yeah. is accuracy. Exactly. A, well, how accurate is, oh, yeah. he, he prophesied 10 things, he sure. did 20 things, he said this sure. or that. And I've always said, I'm going, well, that's not, that doesn't mean anything. It, it, it's, the, we're to judge right. it by the word of God. Yeah. Now I'm going to add to that. Yeah. And does it lead, lead you, back. lead yeah. the person to the Lord that's in just, intimacy? Move him in, closer in, to Jesus. Yeah, closer to Jesus. And that's, yeah, that's I've, really I've had it. some weird prophecies, but it came out. I was in love with Jesus more. Yeah, and and yeah. so, you know, it's the focus is not to be on the prophet. It's the testimony of Jesus is to move people closer to God. Mm-hmm. So and, and that's really what it is. Now, when you get into the end times, this is going to happen in mass. It's prophesied in Joel. Mm-hmm. Peter says this is that, but it wasn't fully that. You don't see signs in the heavens, signs in the earth, blood, fire, and smoke going on at Pentecost. So there's even a greater fulfillment. We saw a sign of fulfillment in Joel's day. You see Acts as a manifestation. Peter saying, this is that, is by the authority of the Spirit. This is that that was spoken of, but it's not the finality. People have still... You know, since then, been baptized in the Holy Spirit, who had only the 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 mess the baptism of John, the repentance of sins, and 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 then they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit after that. We've seen revivals over and over again. Well, they have weird manifestations. Speaking in tongues is a weird manifestation. Right, right. It, it it made the people of that day marvel mm. at it. They, they're going, "How's this happening? What is this?" You know, and 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 so um, we we see that it was a beginning of that that is going on in the Book of Acts. Right. And there's an end of that. Everything in the teaching of the end times, in the the second coming of the, the imminent coming of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth indicates a bride mature, prepared, made ready. And so we see apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, not that sit on the 12 thrones with the 12 apostles, but that are sent ones sown into the body of Christ in this hour to raise up a prophetic church. You see, Ephesians 4 is unto Ephesians 5, a bride made ready. Mm-hmm. That's what is Ephesians. So Ephesians yeah. four isn't the end. The fivefold isn't the end. Yeah. It's it's not. Mm-hmm. We're trying to get to fivefold offices. Ephesians four is unto Ephesians five. A bride made ready, purified, right? Who carries the testimony of Jesus clearly, purely? She's washed her robes in the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. And been made ready for this great union. Now, when John 
sees that, that's when he falls and, and, and the angel's going, don't fall and worship me. He's falling and worship the being, whether it's an angel or an elder, you have to figure out. But he's falling and worshiping that being. And, and he says, don't do that. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So that's actually a sentence you could work backwards and say the testimony is Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, it's unto worshiping God. The mm. end game is not just a testimony, just a, a prophetic word. The end game is moving closer to God, worshiping God. That's wow. the end game. That's what it's all for. Mm. Okay. Now, what did John see? John saw the wedding day. He saw the bride. He says, I saw a great multitude having the voice like the sound of many waters. Okay? The voice like the sound of many waters in every other scripture that, that you go back from there is only ever the voice of God. But now we have a multitude mm -hmm. who have a voice like the sound of many waters. Good. What is that? <laughs> yeah. That's the bride married to the bridegroom. She now has his, his voice. voice. That's so good. <laughs> she has now come into his voice. She's come into union with him. Yeah. This is the voice like the sound of many waters. And that, I mean, there's just a witness of the spirit on that, that the, the spirit of the Lord wants to bring his bride into what is called in Ephesians. Again, the end game is the glory in the church. The glory of the Lord, the essence, the character, the nature, the, the sound, the voice, the, the very essence. It's being formed, Paul says, into the image of Christ. The purpose of all the supernatural gifts, all the gifts, is to form her into the, the image of Christ. Mm. And so if that's not the most prophetic thing ever... What would be, <laughs> right? What, what would it be to, wow. to be one, to be married to this man and have his voice be total agreement with him? And this is, this is what's going on in this hour is a great change. Uh, basically, I heard it said by uh, John Wimber years ago, God wants his church back. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. wow. he, he thinks he's the head. Mm. And he is. <laughs> And, 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 and so, uh, so to speak, a lot of people are going to get fired because they think they're the head. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is, I, I think, the coming of a third reformation. You look at the first reformation as, as, as not as, you know, in the 1500s, but as Jesus flipping the tables. That's a, that's a beginning of a reformation because you have a whole layer of clergy hindering access to God. Right. And he's flipping those tables going, my house is a house of encounter for all God's people. Prayer being an encounter with God, not just saying words. They were saying words there. Right. But it, it, no, they're to access God in that, his house. That's what his house is to be. Mm -hmm. You know, The second Reformation being, of course, in the 1500s, where there's a whole layer of clergy going, you can't get to God except through us. And so I call that, I, th I look at that as Jesus flipped the tables again. Right. He's let my people go that they may encounter me, that they may worship me, you know. The third one being, you know, historically, and you could go back to Moses being the first one, but mm -hmm. the, the third one historically is, I think, coming upon us right now. And it's even where ministers, even prophets, are creating this layer in between God and the people of, you got to get to God through my words and through my my ministry and my website and all of this stuff. And, and God's going, let my people go that they may encounter me. You don't have the corner on the market. The function of prophets is to empower the body to prophesy, not to get in between God and man and be mediators. Mm. The only mediator is Christ. And so this whole move is to do what John the Baptist did, make a people prepared to meet the Lord. And, and that's where this prophecy is so relevant to the hour and so needed in the hour that we're in. Right. Wow. <laughs> that was good. That was really good. Yeah. Really good. You know, as you were speaking, you know, speaking about the bride being made ready and the role of the prophetic in that. You know, the the, the, the bride being made ready is pictured as his bride dressed in white without right. blemish or without right. wrinkle. You know, and then it describes this white 
gown that she's wearing is the righteous acts of the yeah. saints. Uh, she's right living by the time Messiah comes. Um, and that is an extension of, you know, the right word and maturity in the, in the bride. Um, Corinthians highlights to us, and I, well, this is connected to the question I wanted to ask you. Corinthians highlights to us that the prophetic being the highest expression or the highest of all the gifts because of its edifying ability like none other mm-hmm. because it's it's uh, it's discernible it's understandable and therefore its mm-hmm. listeners or recipients can be most edified through it so he says you know I yearn that you all prophesy it's the most edifying of all the gifts it's what will bring about the getting ready of the bride mm-hmm. the best if you will yeah. um, however there is a text and, and this is a text that I think that some might use as a proof text for arguing well maybe not all of us are supposed to prophesy mm-hmm. because he asks the question um, at the end of chapter 12 you know do all are all apostles are all uh, pastors are all do all right. prophesy yeah. and so that becomes for some a limiting yeah. fact I know for, for, certainly for me uh, at the beginning of this conversation not this particular conversation but yeah. the conversation of the prophetic in my life um, I wrestled with that you know I, I, is it is should I be pursuing this maybe I'm just not a, pro- a prophet sure. right and so sure. I should give up on that endeavor if yeah. God wants to give it to me he'll give it to me and so, so you lose momentum when you don't understand that text how do you explain that text yeah I I, I would sp- explain it in a couple different ways um uh, one being Paul says earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you prophesy. Now, to me, if Paul, if we're to ask God and seek God hard for a gift that he's not going to give us, that's that's not a good father. That's cruel. That we're, <laughs> yeah. you know, shall not, you know, it, and the whole teaching in Luke 15 about, about Father, Luke 11, wherever it is, I think it's 15, about, about which of you fathers, you know, is, is, if, if your son asks for a, a fish, he's not going to give him a stone, you know, or a scorpion. Yeah. If you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more mm. will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So the way to get the gifts is not to find the right slot gift that you ask for. Mm -hmm. It's to ask for all of them. That's how you get the gifts. That's how we get everything from God. We ask. Jesus said, you have not because you asked not. You know, and there's so much more. Now, in the end, does everybody get all the gifts? No, Paul describes that, that there's a variety okay, of gift manifestations, and that's why the body needs the body. However, because of this simple definitive testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, is there anyone you would say who's a believer that doesn't have the testimony of Jesus? Mm. No, of course not. Therefore, so how that manifests out, and you have... A mingling. I mean, did John, did any of the disciples, you know, were they, they told when they were sent out in twos, okay, John, you do the prophecy, you know, uh, you know, your partner, James, he's, he's going to do the healings. But if you need discernment, call back for, for this guy because, <laughs> you know, he's got the discernment of spirits. You know, John is called the great evangelist, right? He's also an apostle. Right. Mm. He's also a prophet, right. <laughs> major it's, league. Yeah. And you, we could go, oh, that's the big guys. They all get everything. You know, they get the whole package. But it's, it's you get what you ask for. Come on. It's, it's not what you print out on your printer is your title that you get. You get what you ask for. It's between you and God. And, and so... There are things that I've gotten that I I don't even tell anybody because it's not about that. It's about doing it. It's about manifesting it. I mean, that's that's what it's about. It's about mobilizing the church in building to be ready Mm. for for this coming bridegroom and to to be spotless and pure. And I try to mobilize as many people to prophesy. I'm not I'm not trying to hold up an office here in any way. I'm you know. I also teach. I also, you know, lead people to Jesus, you know. So what am I? I (laughs) I play golf. Not well, but I play golf, (laughs) you know. And and so there's varieties of gifts, but it's not each person gets one gift. I mean, in that 
in that discussion, there's only nine gifts. So somewhere it's going to overlap, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. It's not nine gifts. It's not even distribution. It's not fairness. The uniqueness of you and, and you and me, we are so uniquely different. And, and, you know, I have these weird ponderings with the Lord. I say weird because I don't know anybody that <laughs> thinks this way, but I think this way sometimes. I mean, right now, where we're standing, the majority of people on the earth who have ever lived have never stood here. Do you know that? Mm. Yeah. yeah if you stood in Israel, in Jerusalem, the majority of the people, if you stood the most, if you stood in downtown New York City, the majority of the people who have ever lived on the earth have never stood there. Right. Right? right. Which means that every place that you step is very unique to you. And yet God knows every place, knows every thought that you're happening, you, it, the, the, that, that you're having, that everything about you is a is a pottery unique vessel hmm. that there's only one being who knows everything about you. Even, even your spouse, married, you know, I've been married 40 years. There's way more that my wife doesn't know than she does know about me because I have thoughts all day long, every day. And I, I'm not with my wife all day long, every day. And even if I were, she still would not know everything about me, and yet God knows everything about me. So the way the Spirit mm -hmm. of the Lord manifests through you is so unique. It's so different than every other individual. And that's not to take pride, but to say what a marvelous thing that God wants to bring us into a union. And the only unifying peace is not a gift. It's him. Mm. He's the only unified peace, and uh, you know that's demeaning to call him a peace. He is our head. He is the one that joins us and fits us all together. Mm. And 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 so these gifts, uh, get them all, mm. want them all. Now, one of the ones, and I, I you know I know this is very sensitive for people, is the gift of tongues, and it's so offensive to people's minds and so offensive to everybody, whether you, whether you speak in tongues or not, and that kind of stuff. And everybody has a rule for it, but I want to challenge us with one thing because I see the gift of tongues opening up all the other gifts. Paul said this to the Corinthian church, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. <laughs> now, he's either exaggerating or he has to know how much they speak in tongues and make sure he speaks a little bit more mm -hmm. if he's telling the truth or he never stops speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. When Paul says, when I pray in tongues, my spirit prays. You can't find that anywhere else in the Bible, your spirit praying. So, and Paul says, I can pray with my spirit, and I can pray with my understanding. understanding right? I can sing with my spirit, and I sing with my understanding. So the argument, it has to be a language that somebody knows. For sure, Paul's saying, I don't know it. Why? I don't know what I'm saying. And, and well, we shouldn't use it. It's a gift, <laughs> you know? Well, it's the least of the gifts. Well, what, what would you rather have, the best gift from man or the least gift from heaven? Mm -hmm. I think the least gift from heaven is better than the best gifts of men. And, and, and so Paul's value of that gift and, and historically the ones who, who have valued that gift and moved in power, it's because of that gift that they moved in power. They'll tell you that, you know, the Paul Young he chose and, you know, I pray in tongues five hours every day, six hours every day, because I speak to God mysteries, and mysteries are revealed, manifest when I speak to God. So I, I just want to bump up, because I grew up in the evangelical world, and the demeaning of this gift, and it was mostly because of jealousy, and it was weird and offensive to the mind, but Paul prizes praying in tongues, says, I do it more than all of you, talking about a, uh, the excess 
abuse of doing it publicly in church. And he talks about praying in tongues, which when you pray in tongues, you know, who's, who's supposed to understand the language, but God, mm-hmm. you know, when you pray in tongues. So I say that because this outpouring that happens at Pentecost and manifests in tongues, I, I, it's possible to me because I've seen this happen where they weren't speaking in their languages. They were hearing it in their languages. Mm-hmm. And that's what they say. How, they're marveling. How is it that we hear this in our languages? Right. How, the, how, how are we hearing this? If someone came up to me speaking in a foreign language, I would just assume they know my language. <laughs> but if someone comes up to me speaking in tongues and I hear it in my language, that would make me marvel. Right, mm-hmm. right. You see what I'm saying? So this demand by those who don't have the gift to ascertain the validity of the gift. And I want to move this now over to prophecy. Okay. The whole issue of prophecy is in the church right now is it's to be judged by the pastors. (laughs) And Paul said the prophets discern the prophets which means you got to have prophets to actually discern the prophets in your midst. But we say, no, nothing exists but pastors anymore. And so, so the, 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 the prophets don't exist, so we discern whether they're prophets or not. That's not biblical, mm. you know? And so I, I call the because this is robbing the church from being built up in mm. the holy faith. And for the mobilization of the many, and and, and you know if if you're offended with the the Samuel style of okay you're going to meet this person this is going to happen to you in the future and, and you're going that doesn't sound like a prophecy that's never happened to me I I don't bear witness to that <laughs> you walk it out and if it happens <laughs> you know that was a prophecy there you go and and if it happens and you move closer to Jesus <laughs> then the fruit is there. You know, that kind of thing. But the, I, I, I am calling the church, believing in prophecy or not, back to the scriptures. Mm. Because the, this little proof text of 1 Corinthians 11 and claiming the canon and the completion of the canon is the f- finishing of scripture is not biblical. There was, there was no prophecy of the completion of the canon. There was no prophecy of what the canon would be. The only, the only authority is on the law itself in the scripture and the scriptures that, that, that Jesus quotes, okay, many of which he quotes out of context if you look at our evangelical view of context. My point being the word of the Lord going forth, be it about the donkey that you're going to find or the scripture that manifests in you when it's given, that word of the Lord must go forth in this hour wow. because yeah. we are facing right now, and, and this would have been controversial or scary for people to talk about, but it's so real. We are facing a massive Antichrist philosophy and transhumanism, transgender, all of this. This is this is not just little hurt people, you know, trying to walk out. This is a massive philosophy that's going to manifest in hybridized beings that you won't be able to discern with your eyes who you're actually talking to, and whether you need to run from them or lead them to Christ. And this is where our children, our grandchildren are going to go. And prophecy is God's, and prophecy being all of those gifts, all nine of those gifts, and the discernment especially, it's the greatest lacking one, is the key for the church to be ready in these hours for what's both what's coming with Christ in the millennium. Um, and, and, I mean, we... Uh, and I say this, I've been around the end times teachings a long time, okay? And um, uh, I, I'll say this about this. We can tend into an end times teaching sometimes that it's not pre-rapture, but it's right out the three and a half years. And, 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 and then, 
then you get raptured or ride it out to the seventh trumpet and then you get raptured. And it's the same thing. We think the knowledge and the narrative is sufficient. We need the spirit of the Lord. We need the word of the Lord operating right. in our people. It's, it's not just enough to have the book with the narrative right, right. because Jesus said it's birth pangs and birth pangs are, are, are measured on t- uh, two, two graphs, right? Or, or two, what's it called? Two axes, right? right? So it's not just frequency and getting the narrative right on the linear axis. It's intensity. Come on. Mm-hmm. And good. that takes discernment mm-hmm. to discern the tensity. Is this an end time earthquake lining up with, uh, or, or is this just an earthquake? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, how do you... seeing the mark that, of the beast? Exactly. Or, you, know, you, you, need yeah. you need discernment, you know, or is this, you know, is the vaccine... A little earthquake, right, a right. little where, where this of this, right? you know, a uh, 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 movement towards that. And yeah. so all of that takes discernment. And, uh, and so to just put everything on a narrative, a linear narrative, is actually to go pre-trib rapture in your mentality. And say, all I need is the book. All all's I need the, is the book who has the narrative, right? And then I'm good. No, right. we need the spirit of the right. Lord right. operating in us, giving us discernment. He would say you need both. We, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's helpful to have both. But I, I think in the end, you know, when we stand before the Lord, we're all going to go, great and marvelous are your works. We right, have no right. idea, actually, <laughs> yeah, how this yeah, was going to be. Really <laughs> in the end, yeah, yeah so and somebody, that in somebody our references yeah. our books, and we're going to go, no, don't mention yeah. those, please. <laughs> those were so off, <laughs> you know, compared to this, because it's, I, I love John Piper. He says, look, missions exist where worship, the end is worship. Worship. Yeah. At the end of this, it's this God and knowing this God. It's not about climbing up the levels of intelligence. It's about moving mm. on that sea of glass closer to that one seat of the throne. That. Love, and man. that is the spirit of the Lord that will move through us and make us not compete and want our book to outsell everybody else's books. That, that spirit of the Lord wants to make his whole church in union and ready. And John 17 actually come to full fullness and that kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. So good. <laughs> That's great. Now, we know that, that prophecy isn't equal to the canon. There is the canon of Scripture. Mm-hmm. I just want to make that clear. Mm-hmm. You kind of brought that up, and I was no, like, I, I don't know if that was clear enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I agree. I, I know you, and they don't know you. No, no, I, <laughs> so I, I agree. Prophetic words yeah. are not like Scripture. But, uh, no, that's the evangelical argument, yeah. is that, well, if it's prophetic, then it should yeah, be yeah. in the Scripture, yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. adding to the yeah. Word. Yeah. So. No, no, I, 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 I agree with that. I, I value the words in this book like no other. I, my, my lifestyle is to meditate in verses every single day of my life and try to keep that going throughout my day. Mm-hmm. My focus meditation unto the invitation to meditate day and night, not just on the word, pondering it, extracting it to create narratives, but in the word. Yeah. to meditate and to find the heart of God in Scripture. Right. I spend hours and hours convincing God that I don't believe a passage rather than trying to convince him that I do because yeah. I know that there's more in it than I've ever seen. And we all have this who've lived more than a decade in Christ. God reworks your understanding of verses constantly yeah, yeah. in this. And your theology bucket gets kicked over about every three to five years mm-hmm. with God doing something. And you go, oh, oh. Oh, this is that. I thought this was that, you know, and that kind of thing. So, yes, I believe in a closed canon in that before the return of Christ, I don't think there will be any new uh, any new books in here. However, we do see quotes of other books in here. We right. see the, the quoting in Judah, the book of Enoch, Enoch yeah. and 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 that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, Paul's using. You know, text when he talks about you know um, it, when he uses phrases in a poem from, from in the Book of Acts and this kind of thing and the whole Mars Hill thing, mm-hmm. um, he's using uh, cultural terminology at times yeah. to to do what he does and yeah. so um, and and all of all of them the, from the prophets take 
poetic license at times. I, not poetic license, but, you know, they have the authority of the Holy Spirit to interpret. They're, they're, they're doing what the Jews call a midrash of Old Testament passages many times mm-hmm. in, yeah. in that. So, so, yes, I believe this is a canon. I believe this is 66 books. But I'll say this. I don't believe it's closed. I believe it's open for everyone to enter in. It's a doorway into the revelation yeah. of the knowledge of very God. Good. So very good. good. Yeah. Good. We got about 10 minutes, Bernie. Ten minutes. Yeah, it's about Ooh, all we got flies. left. Wow. It's amazing. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I no, just kinda... not sorry. That was great. <laughs> that was really good. Uh, let's reiterate for everyone who's watching who, yeah. who we're talking to. Absolutely. Yeah. Kirk <laughs> Bennett, he's the director of the uh, prophetic healing and deliverance ministries over there in IHOP Kansas City yep. uh, prayer room. Um, he also happens to be the father of Isaac Bennett. So many of you may know Isaac Bennett from Forerunner Church out there. He's not just his father, but he's also a member of the church. Right. Right. And he told me something like, which I thought was such an endearing thing. He said that he has the best pastor ever. Yeah. <laughs> He's thinking about his own side. Right. I, like, I got the best I mean, senior pastor I know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great He's testament younger than to, me, to Isaac. That's so good. But he I changed his diapers once. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. But, uh, and this is all leading up to the return conference. Yeah, leading up to the return up. conference. Yeah. So again, it's the 27th through the 31st. And we're really excited about that again. And I think that, you know, a, a lot of what you were speaking about today um, is really going to be accentuated through this conference, right? It's really mm-hmm. just understanding how the prophetic, uh, the prophetic uh, word of God is really preparing the church for the return of Jesus. Um, you know, I just mentioned your your credential, if you will, you know, in the house of prayer, and then also being a part of a of, of a, ch- a church community that is a forerunner church. Yes. Um, if you can, in just a couple of minutes, you know, we've been contending, and Gary's been preaching a lot about um, you know us cultivating a prophetic community here. Yes. You know, good. what does that look like? What good. does it look like when the church, when the prayer room is a prophetic community, right, sure. coming together? Wow. Um, how do you envision, you know, the church co- coming into a fuller, deeper understanding of her prophetic identity, how that would impact our meetings, how that would impact our gatherings, even our Sunday traditional services? Sure. How does that impact the prayer room? What is your vision, since you have the boots on the ground over there working towards mm. that, what does that look like when the church finally arrives? Yeah, I, I, and I'll tell you, uh, obviously, we've said it before, mature bride, that's that's one, uh, you know, clear prophetic manifestation that is happening. The 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 marriage covenant of, of individuals in the earth is a, a prophetic walking out of this marriage of Christ in the church, mm-hmm. you know, uh, one day. So the, there's that. Um, uh, the, the other one that the Lord's taking me into, and I'll say into because it's a movement towards the throne, it's not a rabbit trail, is this whole priesthood of Christ as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And I just want to simplify that because that's very undertaught. And I think yeah. part of the reason for that is it will be a major understanding in the last days. But, uh, you know, like the writer of Hebrews says, there's much to say, but it's hard to explain because... The church has become so dull of hearing at this point. And, and, and so it's not, there's not an amount of revelation to say, but it's hard to explain. It's hard to get through. Uh, but the, real simply this, we, Peter calls us a kingdom of priests. He's not just talking to the Hebrew people. He says, you are a royal priesthood. When he's quoting there, he's quoting Exodus 19, 5 and 6, where God says, um, I, you've seen how I brought you out of Egypt on eagle's wings. If you obey my voice, not my commandments, my voice, so he's talking relationship from the very mm-hmm. beginning. You obey my voice and keep my covenant and this is the betrothal that Jeremiah 2.2 uh, talks about. I betroth you in the wilderness to myself. This is the betrothal of the people of God. You shall be to me a segu law. It's a Hebrew word that means the God's own special treasure. It's literally what, what Peter is saying in 1 Peter 2.9. So this, this, you shall be to me a segu law, a special treasure above all the people of the earth. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. So we see in the beginning, God wants a kingdom of priests. Mm. He, 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 he's not saying kings and priests. The word is actually kingdom. Even in Revelation 1 and 5, that word in Greek is kingdom, not kings. Mm. And a different word is used for kings throughout the New Testament. That is not the word for kings. It's the word for kingdom. Anyhow, this kingdom of priests, everyone is a priest. Now, to simplify that, priests worship, they pray, and they prophesy. They live that as a lifestyle. 
they, they, they worship, they enter in, they enter into the, the encounters with the Lord as they're continuous. They give thank offerings to the Lord continuously. Paul says, rejoice always, pray constantly and everything, give thanks. It's that this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. He's talking about you, this royal priesthood. You have access to God, enter in. Jesus said, when you pray, go to the throne room. When you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You're entering right into that throne room as a priest daily and encountering him. Secondly, they intercede. They look down on the earth and say, oh, Lord, let your kingdom come down there like it is up here. That's the intercession that's to be daily. That, that, that prayer is, is Jesus instructing a daily way of interchange with heaven by going to heaven which is where the Father is. You have access to him. It's not your death that qualifies you to access heaven. It's Christ's death, yeah. and he's already died. Come on, I love that. Well right? <laughs> so the veil's been turned. So you have access to God. So intercession is this place of standing in the throne room, in the courts of the Lord, where we're given a chair, a place that we, we're seated, we stand, we, we, we sit, we minister, we burn in front of God in that place as priests, and then we get assignments. It's not one assignment each day. It's many times multiple assignments. So when our assignment of going here and going there is done, we reorient back into that throne. So we worship, we pray, and then our, on our assignment, we're going out to manifest the testimony of Jesus. We prophesy. So our life, and this is what God says he's going to have in the end. I mean, I don't know if you know, God has this will card that he plays. <laughs> you know, my will be done. And you're out. You're out of cards. That yeah. trumps every card is his will card. He says, I want a kingdom of priests. In the end, we see you made us a kingdom of priests. Yeah. God gets his way gets in the end. <laughs> it's a matter of you might as well line up now and understand who you are. So good. And we're that already. We don't become priests then to reign with him as priests. We reign as priests. But we become priests when we are saved. The Holy Spirit is given to us, not just to give us coaching on the earth, but to usher us into that presence, to qualify us. It's a robe of righteousness that is put on us, a clean robe that we can enter in. So we live lifestyles of worship, prayer, and prophecy. That's it, the testimony of Jesus. Whether it's in evangelism or working in a soup kitchen, we're still manifesting the testimony of Jesus. God loves you and wants to be with you forever. That's why we do the soup kitchen. That's why we stand and give a prophetic word. It's the same thing. It's the spirit of compelling people to know the lover of their soul and bringing them into the lover of their soul. So it, priesthood is, is my terminology for this. That's undertaught in the church, but I tell you there's coming a day the book of hebrews will be so taught throughout the church it's the revelation of the priesthood in the new testament and and yet it's 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 going to be taught and the, i'm already seeing i began to prophesy this about five years ago that that the lord is going to just start moving on many many ministers to preach and speak out of the book of hebrews whether it's the lay aside everything that hinders or the hall of faith or all of that that book is the revelation of the end time church is identity as a priesthood. And so that's where we're going, right. you know, and you, everybody can vote on that that you want. We'll see in the end, but I promise you on that day, we're going to say, you made us a kingdom of priests. You did it. <laughs> you know, we weren't willing most of the time, but you did it anyhow, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. and, so good. Yeah. but that's going to be glorious in that day. Praise so, God, man. That's a great answer. Episode one was yeah. amazing today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kirk, for Absolutely. being with us. Thank it's you, been brother. such a pleasure to interview. And guys, if you're watching, uh, again, every week we'll be here at the same day, same time each week. This is episode one of End Time Talks. Join us. Make sure you mark your calendars um, for December 27th through the 31st. Join us in person as best you can with your family. Join us for as long as you can during that week. It's going to be an amazing time. Great. great. Thank you, Kirk. Great having Thank you, you, brother. God bless this you. God bless you. Fun, we'll see you next time. Take care.